you would take your Bibles and we're going to look at Mark chapter 1 and John chapter 1. And we'll spend most of the time in John chapter 1, but we'll start in Mark chapter 1. We all want to be great at something, and it gives us a sense of pride, as we've been talking about pride the past few weeks, to be great at something. And we all desire greatness and be, to be great at something. We all want people to follow us, to pay attention to us, to make note. And you would say, well, Danny, I don't really care. I think at some point in our life, we want to be noticed for something, don't we? And so you're noticed for something. I have a confession to make whenever, like I told you before, Whenever I was noticed at school, most of the time I was noticed for my speed. And then my confession is I played softball this past uh, summer with my family, my boys and cousins, their cousins and stuff. And I was 45. The next youngest person was 24. So I was the old man on the team. And they let me know it. They didn't realize it, but they let me know it. And one of the players on the team played us and says, why is everybody calling you dad? And everybody was calling me dad by the end of the year, and I was dad for everybody. Even Jacob's friends were calling me dad, who was on the team. I'm like, great, that's fine. But what stood out for me, and I have to confess, my career is over. <laughs> Not playing softball, but like I used to play, because I remember the first game, even this year, I took off running, and I pulled a muscle very first game. And I used to have so much speed, and now... They're going, pinch runner. We get one pinch runner an inning, and every time I get on base, they're asking for a pinch runner because, Dad, you're slow. <laughs> so what's happened to me? I wanted to be great at being fast, and it's gone. It's completely gone. My pride is now at so low in sports, and I can enjoy watching sports, but playing sports is not like it used to be. I still say, you have two that are playing college basketball right now, I want to play you one-on-one -on -one to see if I can beat you. And he shakes his head, and Seth shakes his head. There's no way, Dad. But they won't play me. Maybe they're too scared. Maybe I'll rise up again, and I will brag about how great I will be. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bob. All right, Bob and I, two on two. Seth and Noah versus Bob and I. I'll be the one. I'll be the one. Okay. <laughs> Bob will take you on by yourself. That's good. I realize now that my day of running is over. I'm a grandpa officially announcing to you that I'm old, and it's not the same. So this is my pride, swallowing my pride, giving my pride up, and having a vision of what it could be. You know, all of us want to be great at something. We try to be great at something. And like I said, when I was younger, I tried to be great at that one thing, and it's gone. It really is gone, in a sense. Um, and... We strive so much to look apart or be a certain way. And I appreciate my pastor, I hope I don't cry, more than he would ever know, um, the pastor that influenced my life, because I do believe that we have a decision to make in this final landscaping project. And I, the reason why I appreciate him so much, whew, I, didn't, I didn't want to cry, I didn't think I'd cry, and here I am. The reason I appreciate him so much is because I think we have a desire in our pride. We can even, we desire to be known or to be great. And sometimes I don't think those two are the same. And most of the time, if we're honest, even at a young age, we want to be known. In other words, we want followers, even more than ever. Social media would tell us we want followers. You get all these likes and followers you know, if you're on Instagram and you post something, you get all these likes. Or if you're leading something, you get all these likes. You want to be known. But I appreciate my pastor because he was someone who was great. And he didn't care to be known. In fact, when we had youth group, I was the only one, as I told you before. And we still had it. And we had, we had me. And sometimes other people would show up. It would be two girls that would come every once in a while. And we have a whole whopping three. And then... Sometimes it's just me, and he was investing in me, and no one saw it. He wasn't well known, but he, he said, you know what, it wasn't about a big church or a big youth group, it was about investing in people, and he didn't, it wasn't about his agenda or looking the part, and it's so easy, even in ministry, to think that we want to be known because we want to be the church. And I'm not saying that we, we, but churches in general want to be known because they want to do the biggest thing and have the new stuff and all this stuff. And all that's fine. It's fine if, if we were to do that. 
But if it's that just to be known, then what is it for? And so I ask yourself this question, do you want to be great or do you want to be known? And if we're battling our pride because all of us struggle with this, and if you don't admit that you struggle with pride, then you're struggling with pride. Um, we all struggle with a source of pride because we want to be known. We want to be noticed. We want people to look at us. We want this. This has happened from the time. We want the likes on Facebook or Instagram. We want people to look at, wow. And when, and when we get dressed in the morning, maybe at school or something like this, you want to be noticed by someone. You want to be followed, you want to be friended, you want to be mentioned. In fact, if I was to take a poll, how many selfies do we have on our phones right now? A lot. We take selfies and we post them, look at what I'm doing. And we do all this stuff. And again, I'm not saying that selfies are a bad thing, but if it's all about us to be known, it can become, become a problem. We want to be envied. Maybe we buy a certain car because we want people to look at us. We dress our kids a certain way because we want them to say, look at those kids. We want our kids to do well because we say, we want them to say, what a great parent we are. We try to dress nice so people can look at us. We have a bank account that we want that follows our self-esteem because we want people to notice. And if we're not careful, this wanting to be known, this pride, as I call it, in a way, if it can either shut God out and shut us in, as we said before, and it can make things difficult. So my question to you is, how would you like to attract followers? Is it online? Is it to gain a gathering? Is it for people to say, good job? Is it in sports for people to look at you and be the best one? Is it in academics where you're the smartest one in the room? Is it for you to have the most money? We're all striving for something. What if that would be to change? So when did this start? When did our desire for attention grabbing start? Think back to your childhood. Were you one, all of us probably have done this, I went to your dad, mom, look. Dad, mom, look. And after jumping into the pool 25 times, dad, mom, look. And they keep jumping. Why do the kids say that? Because it started at a young age. We wanted to be noticed. I was Superman. I jumped off the edge of the couch. I didn't jump in the pool. I jumped off the couch. Dad, mom, look. I can fly. Boom. Dad, mom, look. I can fly. Boom. And then you get older and dad, mom, look. I can hit a baseball. Dad, mom, look at my grades. And then we become adults. And we say, look, boss, I'm doing, working hard. Look at what I'm doing. Look at my bank account. Look at my time. Because we want to be approved. Look, I've poured into people. We want to be approved. We want to be approved. We want to be respected. We want to be seen as smart, athletic, a good worker. We have an image to hold, right? The problem with all this is that this is what we do. No, I'm not going to throw pencils at you. And I'm going to make it. I promised you I'd make it. We have a self-esteem bucket. All of us do. And we put into that self-esteem bucket our jobs. And it builds up our self-esteem when people say, good job, you're doing good. And that self-esteem just kind of gets up. Maybe it's with our families. Good job. You're such a great parent. Your family's so organized. Self-esteem going up. Maybe it's in athletics or academics or being smart or a bank account and those things here. We put it in here and it builds up our self-esteem. The problem with those things is the next day, usually those things are emptied again. Isn't it? Have you ever reached a point where your self-esteem is just like, no way can say anything to hurt me and nothing will happen that will hurt my self-esteem? None of us, because we put it into the bucket. And if this is how we're living, and I don't want this to be a self-help sermon, it's going somewhere. We do this our whole life. Each day, we have to start over. Are you going to spend your life doing this the whole time? Here's a little trick, or secret, or information. 
If you're doing this, your bucket will never be full. You'll never get enough likes. You'll never get enough followers. You'll never make enough money. You'll never fill that bucket up enough for you to get the self-esteem that you're looking for. Today, if you were willing to listen to what I have to say that God's laid in my heart, your bucket of self-esteem will be overflowing and will never go empty. Now, the little trick in this is this. Most people don't get it. In fact, most people will not do this. If you were to do what the Bible says and what John the Baptist did, we're going to talk about here in a second, your, your bucket would be overflowing and you would be unique to the world in the year 2020. We could have a lot of people chasing likes and followers and self-esteem, other directions. But what if it was different? And if you get what I'm saying today, as I said, your pride will go away. You, any pride that you have, it would be, and I'm not talking about it. We all need to have confidence. I'm not saying that. But the unhealthy pride that's living just for applause will go away. And your desire to be known can be squashed. And your life can be satisfied because it's being used by God. There's no amount of popularity that will satisfy your desire to be recognized. There's no amount of popularity to be desire. It's a bottomless pit. And here's the truth. But we still like it, don't we? Let's be honest. We still like it. It's not that I don't like getting noticed. I remember going to college and showing up to college, and I was a quiet guy, shy, and I had stepped into college. I got a, I got a preaching scholarship, and I show up to college, and we're on this preaching team, and pretty soon I'm the rock star preacher at 18. You know why? Because my pastor let me preach on Sunday nights, and all these people that had surrendered to the ministry hadn't even prayed out loud. And they're like, you've been preaching for a whole year? And I go, yeah. And I'm like, we haven't even prayed out loud in public. Everybody else was practicing praying out loud in public, and I was already preaching sermons. And so then Jerry Kane, who was my, the vice president of the college, used me for revivals. I got to go to revivals all the way. Where. And so for me, in my little corner of the world, I was recognized. And it made me feel a sense of pride. It did. But what I want, to know, want you to know, that it never got my heart to where I thought I had arrived. I rise real quick, especially when I was, I was in a church in St. Louis and it was 500 people. That was the biggest church I'd been at that point. It was like 500 people. And I was at a winter room, and they asked me to speak at this event because they were asking me to speak most often because I was the most experienced college student. And I spoke to a group of 500 people, and I was shaking a boost. I realized how little I am and how bad I am, you know, really in a sense, and how God just promoted me in those moments. But I didn't let it get to me. And I don't want us to ever. We like to hear it, and that's okay to hear it. So when you say, good job to my sermon, I like to hear that. Don't get me wrong. But I can't let it get to me because it's not about me to begin with. So whatever you strive for, what is it that you want to put in the bucket? You like hearing good job. I'm not saying that. But what is it that, that bothers you or gets to a point where it takes over your life, that you're looking for that before God? It has potential to undermine your authority and the potential to undermine God's plan for your life. Would you be willing to surrender it today? John the Baptist, to give you a history of him. Oop, sorry. John the Baptist, as we see, he was preaching a baptism of repentance. He was the first person who did the immersion baptism, not just a ceremonial cleansing. Before John the Baptist, they had a ceremonial cleansing and no one baptized. And this was a big deal. And as we see in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This is going too fast. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized in the Jordan River. So we see John the Baptist is preaching, and if he was on social media, he would have a lot of likes. In fact, a lot of followers. A lot of people saying, yes, good job, John the Baptist. It says, and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. 
all, not just eight people, all were wanting to hear his message. He had a crowd. And if he lived in the year 2020, he would have those likes and those followers and, and all that. And John the Baptist was saying this and, and baptizing, and people were just following completely. And his message was this, after me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And here he has this crowd, a big crowd, well known. And he says, after me is one that's greater than me. And in John chapter 1 verse 19, he says, now this was John's testament. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. And so here they are. After, are you the Messiah, they say? In Malachi, they said that when God does a new thing, a prophet rises up. And they said, some thought he was Elijah coming back. And he says, no, I'm not. Look what he says in verse 20 through 22. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely. I am not the Messiah, they asked him. Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Well, then who are you? And here is the test. It's like a teacher saying, get out a piece of paper and clear off your desk. We're ready for a test. This is John the Baptist test. When I was in college, I had a physics teacher that had a quiz Almost every day, if possible, he flipped a coin every day. And it was always funny. He flipped it real high, almost hit the ceiling. He'd go like this to catch it. And he'd drop it probably at least five times before he caught it. He said he had to catch it first. So we'd spend five minutes him just trying to catch a coin in physics. And he was the smartest guy, one of the smartest guys I ever met. But he couldn't catch a coin. And he would do this. And if it's heads, we have a quiz. If it's tails, we don't. So in the reading, every day, I was ready. Every day we're faced with the tests of our pride. John the Baptist is faced with this test. They ask him, are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? This is your moment, John the Baptist. You have a following. You could easily tell people, I am the one that's coming first, and I am great in promoting self. He could easily do that. And he, he could have easily said this big moment, brace yourself, brag at me, look at this. This test is, John the Baptist, how will you respond? The big moment, the prideful moment. And look what he says in verse 23. Verse 22. Finally he said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back. What do you say about yourself? And then verse 23. And this is, if we're going to eliminate pride, we need to see what John the Baptist said. That your life is not about you. You're a directional marker. Look at verse 23. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said, make straight the way of the Lord. I am a directional marker to the Messiah. We are a directional marker to Jesus. When people look at our lives, we should be a marker of Christ. Not about us, not about filling our self-esteem bucket, but all pointing to Jesus. We are a directional marker and when we get this, our pride diminishes and our purpose increases. He says, I am a directional marker. So I ask yourself this question, are you a directional marker that's pointing people to Jesus or yourself? Do you spend most of your days wanting people to look at you or look at God? Can't have both. Which one is it? John the Baptist says, I'm a directional marker to the Messiah. And it's not about me. We can get lost real easy. I thought I knew Lawson well. We went to youth group this week. I was trying to find Chrissy's, Chrissy's house. And I had the GPS, and it was leading me everywhere but Chrissy's house. And I'm on this gravel road and lost. And I'm, like, trying to figure out a call. I said, I can't find it. And I really couldn't find it. And then in the middle of calling, there's a semi in the middle of the gravel road just blocking the road. I'm like, how do I get out of this? I can't back up. I drove backwards for probably a quarter of a mile in my big van, who I don't like to back up, and here I'm driving backwards just praying that no one comes over the hill. Today, 
Have you been blocked by your own pride like I was this week? Is something stopping you? Is you spend most of your time trying to get attention for yourself and your self-esteem? Do you realize you're a directional marker? Look what John says in verse 27. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of his sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And what John says is I'm not worthy to be a servant. I'm the warm-up. The main act is coming. Coming. Along those same lines that we are to be a directional marker, your life is to be a vehicle to make a big deal about God. If you're going to swallow your pride, it has to be your directional marker and your life is a vehicle. And what that means is the direction of your life, the vehicle in which you have your job, your family, is to all point and drive people to Jesus, not to yourself. Do you live your life in such a way that you're driving people, not in the sense of driving, but driving people and pointing people to Christ? Look what he says in verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes the way of the sins of the world. The reason why I'm here is to make a big deal about God. And the reason why we exist, and if we're going to swallow our pride, we need to place him first and make a big deal about God. Too many of us worry about image. We worry about self-esteem. We worry about filling this bucket up, and that becomes our life. What if our life was to be make God known? The job that you have isn't about just for you to make money. It's about to make God known. That is the vehicle to share the gospel. You are a minister where he's placed you. Do you realize that? You're in ministry. And the people you come in contact with are people that he's going to. He made me the business of reaching, using you in the process. You are a vehicle. So what happens when life gets hard? When the bottom falls out and people start unfriending you? Do you like it when people unfollow you on Facebook or Instagram or all that? They unfriend you. Does it bother you? Do we like to be unfriended, unfollowed? Guess what? It's going to happen. You're going to have people that will unfriend you, unfollow you, and not even really care. And you will say, what did I do wrong? When 2014, 2015, the Royals were almost in the World Series, something happened this Thursday. Most people didn't even know. What happened this Thursday? It hadn't happened in 20-something years. This Thursday, something happened. And it wasn't the Chiefs winning, by the way. I was on the edge of my seat because the Royals almost threw a no-hitter. No one knew it, right? What happened to all those 2014, 2015 fans? They're gone. The Royals stink now, right? We're gone. No, I'm just teasing. So if you didn't watch the game, I'm not blaming you. They do stink right now. The part of mine is there comes a point where we have a lot of fans, and the fans disappear. In our personal life, we have a lot of And there'll be a point in your life where you have a lot of haters. And it could happen quickly. But if you're living for this, and the haters start coming, and it ruins your self-esteem, then you kind of get a sense that maybe you weren't living, you're living for the applause. So what happens when it falls out? In John chapter 1, The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, when the two two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. So John says, This is the Lamb of God. And two of his disciples heard this, left John, and followed Jesus. They unfollowed John to follow Jesus. John is losing his big following. And what happened next, it did not bother John that he was losing his closest followers. At one point they called him rabbi, and now Jesus is baptizing. Can you imagine that some of those followers could have said, wait a minute, John, you were the first to baptize. You were the one doing it. Now Jesus is doing it? What is this? In fact, what they say in verse 26, as we can see, When someone steals our popularity, what do you do? John 3, 25 and 26. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testify at, look, he is baptizing. 
and they run up and they make a comment. They say, look what's happening. You're losing people. You're losing people. He's baptizing, and at the end of the verse says, they're all going to him. You're having no followers now. What do you do when your followers are leaving? And things are not going as well. And your pride has been hit. How do you defeat it? John 3, 27. John realized something real quick. That if we're going to swallow our pride and give it to God and make much about him, we need to come to the grips, this final project, that God is in control. Look at verse 27. To this person, to this John replied, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. In other words, the only reason I had followers is because of God. It wasn't my great ability. God has allowed me to have followers. And now they're leaving. Guess who it's about? God. Whether I have followers or not followers, it's all about God. It's not about me. It's not about my ability, how great I am. I'm such a great baptizer, such a great preacher, fill in the self-esteem bucket. If God gives me people, and if he doesn't give me people, it's still about God. It's all about him. And guess what? He is in control. And if we haven't figured out that yet, we should because we look at our world that's in chaos, that God is in complete control in the midst of us worrying about this, that, and the other. God is in control, and we trust in Him. Whether things go good, things go bad, He is in complete control. Whether we have a following or everybody hates us. Whether we have knownness or fame, it's a temporary gift. It's all from God. John Wesley, a pastor, in the 1800s, his house burned down, and they said, John Wesley, aren't you worried your house burned down? And he says, my house didn't burn down. And they go, what? We just saw that your house burned down. And he says, no, that's God's house. He gave it to me. So now he has to figure out a way to give me another one. <laughs> and in a sense, he's true. All we have has been given to us by God. John the Baptist is saying the same thing. If I have a following, great. I will use leverage to point to Jesus for the following. And if everybody leaves me, Great, I'm still going to point people to Jesus. He is in control. And then he goes on to say, all my life is built on making him known. Today, if we realize that God is in control and all of our life is all about him, then it won't bother us that people stop following. It will bother us when people don't see Jesus. And he says this famous verse, which I want you to quote. This verse should be written on a note card, I think, and placed on your mirror if you ever if you do that or your dashboard because this is the hardest verse, but I love what John the Baptist says. And Fusion used this verse a lot, didn't they? Yeah. John 3, 30. He must become greater and I must become less. Wow. Why is that so significant? Because... His disciples, John the Baptist's disciples that were leaving, a couple of them made a comment. And they said, we need to get more followers. And John says, no, we need to make sure that he has the followers. It's all about him. I want less followers. I want him to have the most because he is the son of God. Would you empty your bucket this morning? And not worry about your self-esteem. And not let it dictate you. And now the rest of your life is all about him making him known. And if we lived every day like this, and guess what? Pride will go away. Because we won't be promoting self. Who are we promoting? God. God. We're promoting him. So when things don't go well, that's God's business. I'm going to keep serving. My desire to be known is not going to own me. Our known, our knownness, our fame, our likes, our followers is a means to make him known, period. End of the question. Means to make him known. 
And if you want to get real weird about it, hang on to this. You never had control of your knownness to begin with. The only reason you have any fame whatsoever or any applause whatsoever, your athletic ability, your academic ability, your, your job ability, all of that, who gave you that? God. And he gave you that to you not so you can just look so good. He gave it to you so you can point and make him known. He has a job for you. Would you make him known? So as we close, there's some point in the review of this. some point, you're going to be noticed for something. All of us are noticed for something. For me, it was running. The beginning, and now it's over. If I would have placed my whole life in the ability to run, I would be in great depression because my son is pinch running for me in softball. Fortunately, I've gotten over the fact that who cares if I can run fast? That I'm a directional marker to the Lord. That my popularity will be taken at some point. Even if you're the most popular guy in the world right now, at some point, your popularity will fade. And when that happens, or is it going to ruin your self-esteem to the point that you don't realize that you have been seeking your own attention the whole time? Remember who it is from and who it is for. I don't know these singers very well. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm disappointed with them because they started out in the church and started singing something, and now they sing something totally opposite of the Lord. They were children of pastors. And I don't know if, to me, it doesn't look like they ever gave their life to Jesus. I don't know. I'm not going to say, so don't sit there and me say, because it's not me to judge if someone's a Christian, but it is me to judge their fruit, and their fruit does not show it. But we have Katy Perry and Jessica Simpson, who are gifted musicians. And it seems to me, Danny McCubbin, this is Danny McCubbin now, this is Danny McCubbin, that they spend their whole time trying to fill the self-esteem bucket and get attention and followers and popularity. And they started in church. What if they would have got it at the very beginning and gave their life to Jesus and spent all the time trying to make him known instead of themselves? I see compromise after compromise. Now, I don't know if they're a Christian or not. Again, I'm not going there. But by the fruit that I see, I'm not trying to judge people, but I also can judge their fruit. I see that they're trying to fill that bucket. Are you going to be someone like that? Are you going to use the gifts that God's given you for your, for your glory or his? Are you going to seek to be known or to be great? That's why I appreciate my pastor. He didn't have to make the headline news small church, but yet he was impacting for eternity's sake. What does that mean for us? In the day, are we listening for the applause of people or the applause of heaven? Would we rather have, and here's a real test that's hard, one million likes by people on Facebook or the one like from our Heavenly Father? What do we seek? What do we strive for? Our knownness or his? If you know me real well, I hate titles. I do. Because if I'm not careful, I can be tempted to want to be noticed. And I hate titles. I hate being labeled a certain title as far as like position. Like when I was a principal or something, people call me the boss. I hate that. I just hate it with a passion. I don't like to be calling the boss. Just don't call me that. I don't know why. I just hate it. <laughs> I can't handle it. I just can't handle it. Maybe it's too much pressure. I don't know. But I'm not going to brag on myself, but I can tell you, I mean, I've told you some things that have hurt me, but I can tell you a success story for me that if you humble yourself before the Lord, he does promote you. And like I said in college, when I humble myself before the Lord, he promoted me and People say, you're pastor of a church. I pastor a church at 18. People are like, wow, how did you do that? I didn't. God did. I really did. I was not very good. I was inexperienced and not very good, and God uplifted me. And I'm so grateful for those opportunities. You humble yourself before God, and you make much of him. And then what does he do? He makes much of you when you make much of him. <laughs> he does for his sake. And it's far better than your sake. And I remember working at a school, Amy had taught at, at a Christian school, and I didn't know a whole lot about Christian school when I got involved in education. And I was probably 20, 21 years old, and they were getting a second building. They asked me to be in charge of that building as a 20-year-old, 21-year-old. 
thinking, I don't know. And they, I had high schoolers that were 18. That's why I grew a goatee back then, because I thought everybody kept calling me a student, and I was the one that was kind of helping be. I was kind of like principal, but not. And then I became a principal at 23. And people say, well, how did you do that? Like, I don't know. It was totally God. When I finally got it, when I finally said, it's not about me, it's all about God. And I've had some times where it's all about me, and he's had to empty my bucket. But I wanted to give you a success story that when I finally got it, and even at a young age, at that point, I, I got it that it was all about him. All I cared about was those, those kids in that school at that moment knew Jesus. They didn't care if they made me principal. It didn't matter to me at all. All that matters is that they knew Jesus, and if God wanted to use me in that position, I'd do it. And so because of that, and now I'm 45, I see if I make much about God, what he's done for me, I don't deserve. Opportunities he gave me, I don't deserve. But I do know this, I want to make much about him, and that's put him first. And I pray that, and I, sometimes it's a struggle, and I go back to my self-esteem bucket, and he continues to work on me. Would we empty it this morning and make much about him, make his name great and ours less? And when we get that, guess what happens? Pride disappears because we spend the rest of our life making him known. Let's pray. Lord, we just are grateful for all that you've done. And I'm grateful that times that you've opened doors for me when I didn't deserve it. And my desire is to make you known. And it seems as when I get that, you just promote and you just open doors. We are a powerful group in this room. And I pray that all of us would spend the rest of our lives to make you known. And if we do that, our church will grow. We will grow. We will impact this community more than we could ever imagine if our whole life was spent making you known. Lord, we all struggle with this. We all struggle with putting ourselves first versus you. We all struggle with self-esteem. We like to be liked. We like to be followed. We like to have attention. We, we like to be respected. We're honest with that. That's not, that's not something that's all of us have that. But I pray that in the daily battle that we crucify that for a moment, for a day, for a year, for a lifetime, and that we empty our buckets. And we don't seek self-esteem based on how many likes that we have and how many followers and how many people are saying good job. But our self-esteem is found in making you known and giving you glory. It's all about you. So as John 3.30, I pray that we would memorize this verse, that you would increase and we would decrease. And it's all about you. And Lord, as, we, as Jenny sings this final song, we want to make sure we put you first. So that would be our prayer this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray.